Caroline Dowd Higgins. Thanks for listening to Your Working Life, my podcast series featuring thought leaders in the career and personal growth arena. I know that you spend a significant portion of your life at work, so I'm on a mission to provide you with tools, inspiration, and resources so you can enjoy your career and love your life. And I'm delighted to welcome my very special guest, Scott Eblen, to the show. Scott, welcome. Hi, Carolyn. Thanks so much for having me on your show. I'm delighted that you're here, and I'm eager to dive into a juicy conversation about your new book. But let me tell the listening audience a little bit about you. Scott is the co-founder and president of The Eblen Group, a professional development firm committed to helping executives and managers improve their leadership presence by being fully present. As an executive coach, speaker, and author, Scott works with senior and rising leaders in some of the world's best-known and regarded organizations. He is the author of two books. Business Book Review described his first book, The Next Level, What Insiders Know About Executive Success, as a fascinating read that is full of potentially career-saving advice. And New York Times bestselling author Marshall Goldsmith says Scott's newest book, Overworked and Overwhelmed, The Mindfulness Alternative, will fundamentally change how you live each day. And Scott, that's a perfect point of departure. I want to dive into the new book. I'm Mm -hmm. particularly interested in that. What prompted you to write Overworked and Overwhelmed? You know, it's probably two things, uh, two big things, Caroline. Uh, as you alluded to in the, in the intro, I do a lot of work with executives and managers and have been in the coaching and, and leadership education business for 14 years now. And uh, what I began to notice uh, seven or eight years ago is that more and more of them are overworked and overwhelmed, you know, the people that I'm working with. And I started asking in my presentations a few years ago, you know, just show of hands, how many of you feel like it's crazier this year than it was last year, or that it gets crazier every year, year over year, and 100% of the hands go up. I have no doubt. <laughs> yeah, and and then the other thing that I started to ask uh, when I was talking with, you know, like, let's say it's 100 executives and managers in the leadership program. Uh, raise your hand if you're in the same job the day you were in a year ago, but the scope today is much bigger than it was a year ago, and 70 or 80 percent of the hands go up. And so I, I think that's one big factor in why people feel overworked and overwhelmed. And I just uh, I, I noticed it so much uh, that I, I really felt like I had to address it, you know, uh, through through my work. And I've had some personal experiences as, as well that I've, I've learned a lot from. And I I address those in the book as well. And I'm really just trying to to draw on interviews with uh, people that I uh, have come across in in business and professional life who seem to have figured it out, you know, at least I don't know if any of us have it 100 percent figured out, but these people do more than most. Uh, A lot of great research that's out there now on how mindfulness applies to everyday people and then my own personal experience, which is, you know, the other big reason I wrote the book. Good for you. Well, I can tell you as a fellow executive coach, this is a resource that I'm sharing with my clients. So I thank you. And, you know, I think it's a it's a classic case of we are all works in progress continuously. So so many takeaways that I am employing in my personal and professional life as well. So I thank you for that. But let's let's unpack mindfulness, Scott. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that and what role it plays in one's work-life integration. Yeah. So, you know, mindfulness is hot right now. You know, it's a a big topic and, you know, cover Time magazine and and everything else. So it's very, you know, it's becoming more and more mainstream. But I think a lot of people feel like, well, that's for somebody else. You know, Mm -hmm. I I can't, I can't meditate for an hour a day. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I'm too busy for mindfulness. And Uh, So what I try to do in in all of my work, you know, whether it's the next level or this new book, is I try to take ideas that maybe seem a little bit mysterious or a little bit complex and make them as simple and as actionable as possible. And so the definition that that I am presenting on mindfulness in this new book um, is that mindfulness equals two, two things. It equals awareness plus intention. You know, so it's awareness of what's going on around me, but also awareness of what my internal response is to what's going on around me, either my thought process or my emotional response or quite often could be my physical response to what's going on around me. That's a sign as well. 
And then once I'm aware, I can then be intentional, you know, about what I'm going to do, or maybe sometimes more importantly, what I'm not going to do yeah, next. Right. So that's how I think about mindfulness. I, I really appreciate that because intention is such an important part of that equation, right? If, if, mm-hmm. if we don't have intention, there's no follow through. And I, I want to dovetail on that. So many of us, right? And there are times where, where I really have to step back and practice what I preach. Mindfulness is not a luxury, but it's a concern for all of us in the professional world, right? This isn't really an option. This is something that we need to think of for for our holistic well-being. So talk to me about that. You know, I heard a great line uh, at a conference a year or so ago from, I noticed on your your website that you've interviewed Sharon Salzberg, one of the, the great leaders in mindfulness in the West. And one of her great colleagues, John Cabot zinn who I'd recommend his books and work to everybody listening, but I heard Cabot zinn speak at a conference uh, a couple of years ago, and he said, yeah, mindfulness is difficult, but what's the alternative? <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> it's like right. if, you, if you stop and think about that, well, like, what would it be? I guess it would be mindlessness. Right, and you that's know? not good. <laughs> no, not, you know, not a recommendation for success at work or anywhere else, right? So I, I think... That's kind of, you know, exactly, you know, what, what's it, what does it mean to you, you know, and, and how can it apply in your own situation? You know, you really, it has to work for the individual. And, and that's really what I'm trying to do through my work as represented in this new book is, is help people make it accessible for people, you know, and, and where can you start? You know, I think as coaches, you and I both do that. We have to meet people where they are. You know, not where, not where we'd like for them to be, you know, or where we think they should be, but where they are. And and so I really try to break it down to, okay, what are some simple things that you could do that are relatively easy to do and likely to make a difference? And, okay, you can't meditate for 20 minutes a day? I get it. Most people can't. Uh, could you could you breathe for five minutes? Well, not even five minutes. Could you take three deep breaths? Let's start there. Let's start there, yeah. You know, and, and so it's just trying to find the the starting point, really. I, I so appreciate the, we've got to meet them where they are. And I think sometimes we, we look to these um, very successful mindfulness practitioners who have really hit their stride. And I think baby steps are are to be encouraged, right? Incremental steps that we can find our way. And everybody has a unique way, and that's okay. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I, I mentioned uh, earlier that my other big reason for writing the book um, it was my own personal experience, and that and that really began. And I would maybe better word is accelerated for me in 2009. I was okay. I was I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in, in 2009, and um, that was a big shock, you know, because I thought I was really healthy. I was a runner, and you know, ran many many miles a week, and things started breaking down. I thought it was running injuries, and long story short, it turned out to be MS, and. That second half of that year and the next year, 2010, were really rough. I could barely walk around the block. I had to drag myself up by the stairs, uh, by the banister to get up to bed at night. Uh, thought process was not good. Uh, you know, I felt like I had a wet sponge in my head most days. Mm-hmm. And my wife, uh, Diane, suggested at the end of 2010, said, why don't you try yoga? I've read that it can help people, you know, with, with MS. And so I said, like, well, how am I going to do that? I can barely stand up. But I, but I went. And uh, I said to the teacher, I said, look, you know, I got in us. You, you really have to watch me because I'm going like, to fall over and stuff. And she said, listen, we've had people like you here before. It's not a problem. And here's the deal. If you come here three days a week, it'll change your body. If you come here more than three days a week, it'll change your life. Wow. And wow. so I started going more than three days a week. And that was four years ago. Um, I travel all over the world for my business. I took a registered, uh, took a 200 hour yoga teacher training course last summer. I'm a registered yoga teacher. Now I do handstands and headstands almost every day. That's great. <laughs> and, well, oh, and, that's but great. Here's, but, but here's the thing is, you know, when I first went, uh, I couldn't do any of that, Yeah. you know, and, and, but it was just, step by baby, baby step by baby step, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that was like such a huge lesson for me because one of the big takeaways is progress comes incrementally then suddenly, yes. you know, it's, it's like you don't recognize the progress you're making until one day you can do a headstand, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of like that. And 
I think that that lesson for me is one that I'm really trying to share with my clients and my readers is start somewhere, you know, and, and, and just keep going. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well yeah. done. So Scott, let's talk a little bit. I know the listeners are probably saying, okay, I'm not ready for the handstand, right? There may be yeah, some yeah. other way where I can lead into this. And mm -hmm. your book is so helpful in that it, it does give you some roadmaps. So tell us about three easy ways that we can practice mindfulness on a daily basis. Ease us into this. Ease you into it. Okay. So I, I talk in the book about what I call killer apps uh, uh, for different domains of routines. And it's, it's part of a model that we introduced in the book called the Life GPS, a personal planning model. But the second big, the the second of three components of the life GPS is about routines and physical, mental, relational, and spiritual routines. And I talk in each of those chapters about a killer app. You know, like if you're only going to do one, if you're only going to do one thing, you know, probably try this. So, like for instance, the killer app for physical routines is movement. You know, which there's a lot of things you could do to be in good physical health, but movement is probably a great place to start. You know, there's a lot of research out now that you can summarize with the headline that sitting is the new smoking. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so I think it's not just your, your daily workout, if you have one, that's a great thing to do. But it's also getting up and moving like every hour, you mm -hmm. know, especially if you're in an office job where you sit in a chair because one, your 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 mental focus begins to degrade somewhere between forty five and ninety minutes. You know, if you're focused on any given task, and so getting up and moving, changing it up, giving your brain time for unconscious thought. I mean, if you ask people where do you get your best ideas, they're usually going to say when I'm on a walk, when I'm on a run, when I'm in the shower, when I'm cutting my grass. They never say when I'm sitting in front of my computer at my desk. Right. You know? <laughs> in the, um, in the zone. Yeah. Yeah. It's because you need, you, your brain needs a break. And one of the best ways to give your brain a break, ironically enough, is to move your body, you know, to do something different physically. And, and so movement is, has tremendous physical benefits, but also great mental benefits. And it's a really great way to be mindful. Uh, you know, aware and intentional, you know, I, I can be aware that, wow, I'm just not uh, in the groove right now. Let me be intentional about breaking it up a little bit, taking a 10 minute break, walk around the building, walk around the campus, walk around the block yeah. and then come back and, you know, get back to work. And nine times out of 10, you're going to be a lot more productive when you come back. after I, that. Break. I love that. It's almost like rebooting, right? To give it your totally brain a chance is. to reset yeah. and say, okay, yeah. I'm it's, it's back. Push, push the reset button basically. Yeah, totally. Oh, nicely. Let's talk a little bit, Scott, about priorities, right, and mm -hmm. how we can, you know, the word balance, I think, is fascinating. Fundamentally, I get it, but I think it stresses some people out. I don't believe in that perfect work-life balance. I think it's yeah. always a, an adjusting of the fulcrum, if you will. But how can we balance our priorities at work and at home and community, however we're involved, mm -hmm. to be more fulfilled, right? Not yeah. just to say, hey, we're going to get it done, but how do we find more gratification and satisfaction from that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm with you on being anti-balance. <laughs> Uh, the uh, one of the most popular posts I ever wrote on my blog was called "Why I Don't Believe in Work-Life Balance," yep. and I, I don't think it's a helpful metaphor uh, because I think it it sets an unattainable goal. Like, oh my gosh, everything's in balance. Well, right. yeah, for right now, you know, and then it's gonna, you know, it's gonna change in uh, about five minutes from now. Yeah, yeah. And and so the the metaphor that I really prefer is rhythm. Nice. What's what's your work-life yeah. rhythm? And if you understand the major components and elements of your rhythm, then you can, you know, you can kind of feel a little bit more relaxed about it, right? Like, well, you know, right now, this week, the rhythm is really heavy on work, okay? Because yeah, we've got this big project we're trying to get out or this customer that we're trying to, you know, do a, do a presentation for or whatever it is. Okay, great. Uh, as long as you understand that you have other priorities in your life at home and not just work, but in the community as well, uh, then... Okay, I can get back to that. It's just it's just not in the rhythm today, or it's not in the rhythm this half day or this week or whatever it is. So I think that's you know that's a pretty pretty big shift for that people can make. You know, is go from balance to rhythm. I love um, it. Yeah, I'd also encourage people to. Uh, I just would like to run quickly through these three questions in the Life Please. GPS. Um, first big question in our life GPS model is how are you when you're at your best? You know, when you're really in that state of flow or in the zone or whatever it looks like for you, you know, time just flies because you're just so absorbed with what you're doing, whether it's your kids or your work or your, your partner or whatever. Um, 
what's that look like and feel like for you and capture, you know, the four or five words or short phrases that represent that for you at your best. Cause that's what you're trying to get back to. Right. And then what are the routines, which we talked about a minute ago, physical, mental, relational, and spiritual that enable you to show up at your best. Um, you know, Aristotle had that great line about, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. What are the habits or routines that you need to be excellent, to show up at your best? And then finally, the last big question in the Life GPS is, so what are the outcomes that you would hope or expect to see in your life at home, your life at work, and your life in the community if you're showing up at your best most of the time? You know, And it's what we encourage our clients to do. We give them a format for capturing their answers to those three questions on one piece of paper. And just like the GPS app on your smartphone, it becomes a reference point. You know, if you if you enter a destination, you're more likely to get there. And it's not to say that I'm attached to these outcomes, like, oh, my gosh, if that doesn't happen exactly the way I dreamed it was going to happen, I'm, I'm going to be devastated and disappointed. It's more being intentional about what you're trying to create. You know, Gandhi said that we should never take an action without an expectation of the result that should follow. And that's kind of what I'm talking about, you know, is like, okay, at your best, what's that look like? What do you need to show up that way? And what would you expect to see if you did? Great questions. And it gives us certainly something to think about and something to consider hiring a coach for, right? This is music to my ears. Good stuff. Because you don't have to do it alone, right? Having someone help you and guide you and navigate you through that journey can be an incredible experience. But Scott, I want to talk a little bit because I know you and I, with our respective clients, do come in contact with people who've burned out, right? Mm -hmm. Who really need to get back to a healthy and productive lifestyle and and happy lifestyle again. So what advice do you have for our listener who's either at the burnout stage or getting close? Take the night off. Mm, Brilliant. (laughs) And and relatively simple, right? Easy to do and likely to make a difference. Yeah, literally take the night off. Uh, One of my favorite stories that I came across in writing this new book was a a woman, an executive who has gotten into the habit this year, when she pulls her car into the garage, she has to walk through the laundry room to get to the kitchen. And she is now in the habit of taking her iPhone out of her purse when she hits the laundry room. She's got the charger for the phone plugged in over the washing machine. Uh, uh, phone yeah. gets plugged in, turns face down on the washing machine. She closes the laundry room door and doesn't come back for it until her kids are in bed two or three hours later. And what that the very first night that she did that was like a life changing experience, you know, because the kids were calmer, they were happier because they had their mother's full attention and presence. Her husband was happier because he had the full presence and attention of his wife. And she was happier because everybody else was happy. And and she started to notice things that, you know, she wasn't noticing when she was checking her email every five minutes. Right. And I asked her, I said, so like, was that hard to do? She said, oh my gosh, for the first couple of weeks, I felt like I had lost my arm because <laughs> she was so habitually used to checking, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and being constantly connected to her work. But she said, you know, the benefits even that first night were so enormous that I knew I had to keep doing it. And now it's no big deal. It's just what I do. That's great. You know, so start small, you know. Take, and take she changed off. behavior. Beautifully yeah, done. Yeah. So, Scott, I have to ask, because the book is so robust with research, so tell me a little bit more about how you pursued the research and what was most surprising to you as you as you researched for the book. Hmm, that's a great question about the surprising part. Um, so I'm not really sure I have an answer to this. <laughs> part, so I'll think about that for a minute. But the the way I went about the research, it really kind of came uh, from three or four streams. Uh, one was the interviews that I did for the book. I got to interview about 50 pretty successful leaders, like I said earlier, executives and managers and some thought leaders from from the mindfulness space as well. And and so I learned a lot from them, and a lot of the the suggestions that I offer in the book really are straight from the interviews that that I conducted. Then the other research that I, I you know wasn't primary research on my part; it was really more just gathering the research that others have done. There's mm-hmm. with the advent of the functional MRI machines. Um, there, John Kabat-Zinn talks about this in the new edition of his book, Full Catastrophe Living. I, and I'm going to get the numbers roughly right here. But there's been like a tenfold increase in academic research on mindfulness in the last 10 years. And so much of it is driven by uh, the pictures that we can get now of how the brain lights up in response to different stimulus. And 
Um, you know, a lot of that's around mind. You know, we can we can we can see the impact of mindfulness meditation on on the brain and in turn on the body. And so there's just a, a ton of good research out there that I was able to to draw on, and it was a great time to write the book because it's you know it's just so readily available. I think now I have an answer for you on the biggest surprise. Okay. Um, the uh, there's an enzyme in your body called telomerase, and telomerase is the enzyme that's responsible for keeping little protective caps on the ends of your chromosomes. The protective caps are called telomeres. And telomerase keeps them long and healthy. Over the course of a life, telomeres shrink. You know, it's just the, the aging process. But telomerase keeps them long and healthy, and it helps your genetic expression, right? I mean, you know, it just keeps your body functioning well. Well, there's research mainly out of the University of California at San Francisco uh, with Nobel Prize winning uh, researcher named Elizabeth Blackburn and her t- team and colleagues have determined that even 10 minutes a day of mindful breathing or mindful meditation based on mindful breathing increases the amount of telomerase in your body. And and so when I first learned that, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I have MS. Why would I not meditate every single day? Right, right. You know, if if my if my genetic expression is going to be healthier and more robust because I spent that 10 minutes, you know, focusing on my breathing. And, you know, that's that's not just surprising to me it's it's affirming you know yeah. and it's and so you know since I, I learned that about a year and a half ago or two years ago and I've I've been a very consistent meditator every day since then and sometimes it's only for five minutes like if I'm on the road and I've got time zone stuff I mean you know it's it may not be the 15 or 20 minutes that I'd prefer but I, I do it every day and I see the I feel the impact of that in so many different ways. I mean, one of the things with MS, you have to manage your stress if you have MS. And if you don't, you feel it in your body immediately. You feel it physically. And and so I, in a way, I have an advantage, you know, because I have this little built-in biofeedback system yeah. that tells me yeah. when I'm overworked and overwhelmed, that you need to stop and breathe for a little bit, or you need to go for a walk, or you, need, you really need to make sure you get to yoga today. Uh, because you know, I feel it in my body. So what I'm trying to help people think about is, you know, I'm not advocating that you go out and contract a chronic disease. I mean, you know, and I'm sure a lot of the people that are reading my book and listening to me speak have chronic diseases, and, but most don't, fortunately. But what if you lived your life as if you had one? It, you'd do it a lot differently if you, if you did. And so that's just I'm trying to share what I've learned. And I think part of being mindful is also listening to our bodies, right? And that message that you're sharing with us is so valuable. It's priceless. I don't think we often get quiet enough to really listen to what our bodies need, right? No. Yeah, I think we tend to sort of put our head down and plow right through. I mean, right. that's, to, that's totally how I've been for most of my life. And um, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm yeah. glad. And you're, yeah. you you yeah. are a wonderful uh, lesson for us to learn from. So thank you for that. So, Scott, in wrapping up, I think your book is extraordinary because it is a tool, right? It is you in coaching form in the book sharing with us what we can do individually to be more mindful. Now, what can managers do to help uh-huh. their employees, right? Because yeah. I think it's wonderful for us to take action individually. However, I think the employers listening need to get some skin in the game as well. So how can we collectively help in our work environments? That's a fabulous question. So one of my favorite lines of all time is leaders control the weather. Yes, Um, very well put. You know, know, just if leaders having a happy day, everybody's going to have a happy day. If they're stormy and cloudy, you better buckle up because it's going to be a rough ride that day. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you believe that, which most people when they think about it do, and if you're the leader watch your impact. Okay. So like the very first thing you could do to make it better for people is quit sending emails at 11 o'clock at night. Exactly. Uh, Well, that's just when I do emails. I don't expect people to answer. Well, guess what? If they're getting an email from the boss at 11 o'clock at night, most of them are going to feel like they've got to answer it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you don't even realize that the impact that you're having. So be more aware and intentional, be more mindful yourself, at least just aware and intentional about the impact that your actions and your words have on others. That's the place that I would encourage them to start. 
Brilliant. I love it. And I think they need to take some onus in this uh, responsibility, right, to be more accountable. If we can have a culture of advocacy and look out for each other, all boats will rise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, Scott, tell us how we can buy your book and and follow you online. I'm sure you've attracted lots of great listeners today that want to follow up with you. Yeah, so the book uh, is available on Amazon. It's Overworked and Overwhelmed, The Mindfulness Alternative. And it's available on other websites like 800 CEO Read and Barnes & Noble and pretty much anywhere you can buy books online. Uh, It may be in your local Barnes & Noble store if you'd like to do do it that way. Um, You can follow me on Twitter at Scott Eblin, uh, C-O-T-T-E-B as in boy, L-I-N. And you can uh, get in touch with us through our website, eblingroup.com. Excellent. Scott, what a joy to have you on. I thoroughly enjoyed your book, and I thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I thank you for reading it and for talking with me, Caroline. Absolutely. Take good care. You too. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning into your working life, where my goal is to help you design your career destiny so it doesn't happen by default. True career and life satisfaction is possible, and it's time to embrace what you love doing so you can do more of it. I'm Caroline Dowd-Higgins. Take good care.